Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. It is uh, a blessing to be with you today. And before I get into the message, I just want to welcome those who are um, here for the first time, seen a few people around. And so you're more than welcome to be here in the Wonturna Church family and also those who are online, sipping a cup of hot chocolate, enjoying their time on the couch. Um, Now, it's interesting. This week, and I just have to send my apologies from my wife and my children, uh, has been one of the weeks that you just don't really want in your household. Um, At the moment, I'm probably preaching at about 60-70% energy. In fact, this morning, I texted um, our head elder Paul and Ben, and I said, get ready. I may not be able to to come in today. Uh, But lo and behold, a trip to the chemist and different things, God has gotten me through. Um, And we just want to send our apologies again as a family. Maritza was in hospital on Tuesday, just to give you an idea of all the things that were happening. And I got to Friday, actually, yesterday, feeling okay. But then waking up to today, you know, you kind of feel like you're not 100%. So uh, I'm sorry, I won't be as energetic as I usually am up the front, but I count it as a blessing that I'm here today. And I haven't let the irony go past me that I'm preaching about health today. I totally understand, and I think that God may have done that for a reason, to just kind of hammer it home. This is important. This is how important. When you take it away, I tell you how important it is. So I want to thank also um, those part of the worship team. Amazing. I love the whole stripped-backed approach. It was really nice. Uh, And Liz, that was a great prayer. Julie, I know how much effort you put into your children's stories. And for those people who don't see how many slides and all the different things she does on her computer just to get it all ready, um, it was a great story. And I know we all enjoyed it, even though the children weren't here. So thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and start today um, with a word of prayer, as I usually do when I do my message. Uh, and then we'll get right into the last uh, sermon that we have in the Sozo series. So I invite you to bow your heads. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you again for who you are. We want to thank you for your Sabbath, and we want to thank you for health. We know how hard it is to get through if we don't have it. And so I pray that this message, uh, although it might be stripped back myself as I preach, I pray you give me the energy and strength, and I pray that the message will be able to go to the ears and the hearts that need it the most today, is my prayer in your name. Amen. Now, can I just also affirm my elders, it is great to know that I can text them on the day and Paul uh, has a sermon ready to go. Paul, I don't know whether I'm going to get through today's sermon, so if I stop halfway through, you just carry it on, okay? You just, from where I left off, you yeah, good on you, mate. All right, so, so, so for those who haven't been a part of the series for the last two weeks, we've been talking about a certain word. It's been surrounded by this word, sozo, and I'll give you a very quick recap of what sozo actually means, because as I said before last week, it can mean a whole lot of different definitions, but it also means the same thing. So it can mean saved, it can mean healed, it can mean delivered, it can mean preserved, it can mean protected, it can mean prosperous, and it can also mean to be made whole. And all of those definitions are connected, and they all work together to form this word that we call Sozo. And the best one that I like out of those ones is the word that Jesus came to make us whole. He wants the best for all of our facets of life. He cares for everything from the big crazy things to the really small insignificant things that may be for you. He cares about everything. And the verse that I used last week to kind of center the message was in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and it read this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A simpler way of saying what was said there in 1 Thessalonians is that God cares for your physical, your mental, your emotional, and your spiritual self. In other words, your whole being. But today, we're going to be focusing, lastly, on the physical. And excuse the picture of me at the gym in the background there. Um, I did cut off my face. I don't know why I did that. Um, But this idea of physical is very, very important. 
And I didn't have this in my notes, but I think God really did hammer it home to me that I'm standing here with not 100% energy and vigor that I usually would have. And I can see how important it is even to spreading the gospel that physical health is to us. Now, you may, and I look around the, the, the place here, and everyone's got their own different struggles with physical health. And a lot of the time, it's very front, and people see the struggles. And for other things, like even the mental stuff we talked about last week, are in the background, things that we struggle on our own. But this idea of this physical health, and if God actually wants this to be good in our lives, is actually a question that comes along quite often. And so we are going to be focusing on the word why today, because when it comes to all the different things, we've gone through the spiritual, the emotional, and the mental, the question of if or why God thinks it's good never comes to mind. Of course, we think that God wants our spiritual life to be good. Of course, God wants our emotional life to be good. Of course, God wants our mental life to be good. But a lot of people think that maybe God doesn't really care too much about this side of the fence. As if all the other ones are really, really important, but when it comes to the physical, hey, you do your thing. You do your thing, it's okay. And in fact, I had a friend who is no longer in ministry now, but he was when he told me this, he said this. He said, if God really cared about your physical body, why doesn't he mention it more in the Bible? And it was actually a really good question to me. Because if you read the Bible, there's not many verses that tell you to go and exercise. There's not really many verses that you have to do this or that or this to keep yourself at peak performance, to have the best body. None of that. And so when I was doing research on this topic, it really did open my mind to what it means to have physical and how important it is to God. Now, as I said before, too often we create a hierarchy, and I just want you to think about this for a second in your own minds. Spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. What do you think is number one on the hierarchy of needs for God? Spiritual, right? Now, this is all natural. What's usually after the spiritual, out of the mental, emotional, or physical, typically? Maybe, maybe the emotional, because God talks about how he doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the what? At the heart, right? Okay, so maybe the emotional is next, which leaves us mental and physical. And of course, we have verses that Paul talks about to say, keep your mind pure, think of good things, make sure that these are in your mind. So maybe you put mental there. So you've got spiritual, emotional, mental, and then there at the bottom is good old physical, not really getting much attention at all. And again, as as I pointed out before, it's not necessarily in the Bible as much as the other three. So I can't blame you for actually having that perspective. So today we're going to have a look at some of these different things. And I know last week I said I'm not going to be busting myths, but I have to do it again because it's such a good structure for the series. And so there are two myths that that I'm going to break again, I'm going to bust. And the first one is that God doesn't really care about the physical needs of us. Maybe I just say that again, he doesn't care as much as the first three things, social, emotional, and mental. Too often we see Christians, pastors, put away the physical side and not really care about our health as much as we do the emotional, or of course the spiritual side of things. And in my time, I have been to many different pastors' retreats and different conference retreats and seen a lot of pastors come together. And I can tell you there are all different types of body sizes and different health and all these different things. And so when it comes to this conversation, even amongst pastors, we're still not 100% agreed on what it means to have the physical and how how important it is. But I just want to share with you, and we're going to go through this verse pretty much all of today. And it's in 1 Corinthians 6. So if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to be looking at a few verses in this chapter. There aren't many instances in the Bible where it talks specifically about the body. But this one is very, very clear. And so we're going to look at it together as a church. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 12 to 13. And it starts off like this. 
you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. It's a bit like a riddle. You say, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. Now, I could just step back and just allow that verse to speak for itself and say, sermon is done. Look at the last line. The Lord cares about our bodies. But I just want to take you through some of these things because in verse 12, which is the first sentence there, it's as if Paul is making a concession and saying that maybe what you eat is not as important as other things that we want to teach you. Now, that might feel a little bit hard to hear as Adventists because health message is so important for us. In fact, we have such a good health message to preach. But Paul here in the first verses is basically saying, look, you're allowed to do anything you want, but there are consequences for what you do from those choices. So it's almost like a concession to say, maybe... It's not as important as we think it is, but there are still consequences for that. But in verse 13, you could keep reading and it says, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. Now, who can actually replace the word stomach and put their name there? I can. Food was made for me and Dan was made for food. That's basically how I was from from when I was born. Food has always gravitated to me somehow. And do you know what I can tell you? Having a girl and a boy, having your genetics come across. Naomi, she's real picky. She's a real picky eater. But Lucas, oh man, I'm worried about my wallet. I can tell you right now. The, the things that he eats, and he's not even one yet, and he is just eating a lot of food, right? And so this idea of food for us comes more naturally than others. Some of us are food lovers like me, and some of you guys are not. But you notice the next line there. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. It's kind of like, again, just another concession to say food is important, but everything's going to be done away with eventually. It's a bit like a riddle where there's a concession and then a truth, a concession and then a truth. And in that last verse, it says, and they were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. So here's my question. It's still a little bit confusing even when you look at these verses. Whether or not physical health is important to God or not, we can see that last verse that it is, but there's always this kind of back and forth. So the first question is, why does God not mention physical health more than the other three? Well, let me tell you something. He actually does a lot. It's just that we look in through our 21st century lens and say, you know what? God doesn't tell me to go to the gym so I don't need to go to the gym, right? Or I don't need to go for a run because he doesn't tell me to do that. But I just want to show you something really, really interesting when it comes to health in the Bible. Now, in the Old Testament, right, there are a lot of laws. If you read the first five books of the Old Testament, you realize there are laws galore, right? But I want to show you something. These are some of the things that are in these books. In Leviticus 15, it, there's, this is a law. This is quite literally a law from the, from the top. They tell people to have a bath and to wash their clothes. Now, do you think that's a little bit weird that in a civilization, there is a law that tells you that you need to bath with certain circumstances and wash your clothes in certain circumstances? It seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Until you step back and you realize what the other civilizations were like. Now, we're talking a long time ago. This civilization, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, all these people who were around uh, the Israelites at the time had no idea about hygiene. They had no idea about parasites. They had no idea about transmitted diseases. They had no idea about any of this. In fact, a lot of the diseases they just put back to, well, it's the gods. But here in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, it says, you guys need to bath and you need to wash your clothes. Have a look at this in Deuteronomy 23. You need to do a number two in a covered hole. Did you think that that was in the Bible? Right? 
Now, again, you think, why are you bringing this up in a sermon? Because this was groundbreaking stuff. Why on earth did they have to do the number two in a covered hole? Isn't that just normal? Doesn't that just make sense? No. When you look at some of the literature about what the other civilizations are doing at the time, they would just do it in the street. And they would just go wherever they wanted to. And in this verse, if you read Deuteronomy 23, 12 to 13, and you may not believe me, but have a look at it now. It says, move away from your tent, dig a hole, do your business, and cover it. This is a long time ago, and you think, how on earth is this groundbreaking? I can tell you it very much is. God was sending a message to the Israelites that health was very important for them. I'll keep going. Leviticus 14, you need to quarantine if you're sick. Now, we know all about quarantine, right? We've done that, all of that. But this, again, 4,000 years ago. And people didn't understand that if you're coughing or you're sick, that something would be transmitted to somebody else. And yet God says, guys, if you are sick, put yourself away for seven days, allow it to go through, and then come back to society. Another one, quarantine if you touch the dead. This one is a bit of a no-brainer too. There are so many diseases that come with this. And the last one, which we probably know a lot of, is in the whole chapter of Leviticus 11, there's this list of clean and unclean foods. Now, I want to ask you a question, church. All of those rules that were done about 4,000 years ago, do any of them still pertain today? Is there still logic in any one of those ones? Yeah? I would say every single one, right? Because health is health, no matter you were born 4,000 years ago or you are born today. It's just, and it's quite funny that a lot of those things, we only really found out the, the, the logic behind all of it a century ago. Some of them even a decade ago. We're still learning about the wisdom of God that he gave to the Israelites. They had no idea why these laws were laws, but they followed them because God gave it to them, because God cared about their health. In fact, you could probably say that the first five books of the Bible is God caring about his people, and that's why the rules were given to them. And health is definitely one of the big ones. But you might ask yourself the question, but there's nothing about exercise. Who's, who's excited about knowing there's nothing about exercise in the Bible, yeah? <laughs> this idea of understanding whether or not you know you need to exercise, and this is one of the big things that uh, my pastor, ex-pastor friend, actually said to me, he said, why do I need to exercise if it's not in the Bible? Now, I want you to put yourself in the position of someone two, three, or 4,000 years ago. And I want you to ask yourself the question, what are you doing all day? Are you sitting down watching Netflix? No? So what's the man typically, typically doing? He's toiling the field, or he's working the business, or he's probably walking to and fro different places, right? He didn't have to worry about his daily exercise at the gym because he was getting it doing his normal activities. Now, if you were a woman, there's probably even more on your plate. Can you imagine all the things that you do as a parent with all your kids, but manually, right? No dishwasher, no washing machine. Think of the nappies, right? Think of all the different things you have to do, how you cook your food, and then you go to and fro to grab the water. There was no problem when it came to exercise because they didn't have to worry about it. This problem of exercise is a very modern problem that we have. Comes the industrial era, and then we have things like cars and planes and computers and mobile phones and Uber Eats. And you can literally sit in your home today and you can eat, sleep, play, work, and you can survive pretty easily and never leave the front door of your home, right? It's the culture that we're in that's the problem, not the Bible. And so I kind of push back against those who say exercise is not important because it wasn't a question back then, because that's all they were doing, walking, labor, all those things they didn't have to worry about, but now we do. And so it's a bit of a moot point about this idea that maybe God doesn't really care about health because we can see it in the Old Testament. We haven't even gone to the New Testament yet. We can see he cares about our health when it comes to diseases. 
And we know that he cares about our physical health when it comes to exercise. So you know what I'm going to do next, church, yeah? You ready? We're going to bust it? All right. That's the first myth. This is the second one. We're going to get a bit more spiritual now because they're all connected. Why do I have to worry about my body now if I'm going to get a new body when Jesus comes back? Right? Okay. New body, doesn't matter what I do with what I have here on the earth. Now, some of us have been gifted really beautiful bodies and we don't have to worry too much. Some of us have different size bodies. Some of us don't really care too much about what it looks like. But does God actually care about what we do with our bodies if he's going to give us a new one when he comes back? Let's keep reading 1 Corinthians 6. And I want to show you a verse uh, in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians. The first one is this. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Okay, great. So we're going to be raised from the dead. And have a look in 2 Corinthians. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. Who here is really excited about their new body in heaven? Anyone excited about a new body? All right, everyone who doesn't have their hand up loves their body right now. Yeah? Okay. I'm super excited about a new body too. Weight has been something that I've struggled with all my life. I was going to show you a picture of when I was younger. I decided not to because it was really embarrassing. But I was not a skinny guy. I've never have been. In fact, my dad at his heaviest was 170 kgs. Now, he's the side that I get my Kiwi and Samoan side, right? So we like to say we're big boned on that side. But weight has always been something that I've worried about. And this is actually something I had thought. Why do I need to worry about what I have now if Jesus is going to come back and he's going to give me a new body? Life is short. Eat what you want. Be happy. Be merry. Because God's going to come back soon. Have a look at this. 1 Corinthians 6, further down that chapter, 19 and 20. Don't you realize that your body is the what, church? The temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. Wow. For God bought you at a high price. So you must honor God with your what? Your body. Your body that you are in right now is actually not your property. It's a rental. It's a rental car, right? Now, some people have, again, rental cars that are little mini Toyota Corollas, and some have big Land Cruisers like me, and some are a little bit more expensive. Some are not that expensive. We all have different types of body styles. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter what you have. What matters is that God wants you to take care of it. It doesn't matter what your body is at the moment. God wants you to take care of it. He even says that you honor God with what you do with your body. So if you mistreat your body here on earth, you are actually mistreating God's property. And I have never thought about it that way. Because we live in a culture where we talk about things like my body. This is my body. No one can touch it. I have full access to it, and nobody else can tell me what to do with it. Well, actually, the Bible says that it isn't your body. It's God's. And you can't mistreat what you have. It's kind of like saying the creation around us and what's given to us with the animals and the plants and the beautiful nature that we have, do you know what God's going to do with it when he comes back? It's all going to get destroyed because we're going to have a new earth. So why do I have to look after it if God's just going to create something new? It's the same logic because we know that God wants us to protect his environment. It's just in the DNA of humanity. I mean, you look at Adam, he literally is created. God has this beautiful kingdom that he's given to Adam. And the first thing that he says is, look after what I have created for you. That is literally your first command. Now, if we treated the environment and our bodies the same, then we would say, you know what? God's going to come back, replace everything, so I don't need to worry about it at all. But in fact, we need to look after our bodies because it gives 
honor to God. So before I bust this myth that just because God's going to give us a new body when he comes back, I just want to give maybe a bit of a disclaimer for us as an Adventist church. As I said before, we are very strong with our health message. And I thought about actually preaching about the health message today, but I don't think I'd give it enough justice tacking it on to what I'm talking about. That's a whole different sermon altogether. But I just want to give you a disclaimer. Some of us can treat health to the extreme, and that is not good either. We can actually treat health so extreme that we can become a stumbling block to others who actually just want to know Christ. Let me give you an example. I was out here in the car park only a few months ago, and as I was walking out, this man came up to me, never seen him before, never seen him again, and he had no idea I was the pastor of the church. So I was like, great. And he comes up to me and he looks at me and he doesn't say hello. He doesn't say anything. This is the first thing he says to me. He says, excuse me, are you a vegan? And I said, well, I'm good to meet you too. No, I'm not a vegan. The next 10 minutes in that car park, he was telling me how bad the church has become. Because not everyone in the church is following the health message of being a vegan. He had no idea I was the pastor. He was coming up to me as if I was just a normal church member. And he was preaching to me that the church is going downhill because we're not all vegans. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that I was energized and I went home and I chucked out all of the meat, all of the bad foods, and I became a vegan on that day? What do you reckon? Obviously not, right? But let me tell you something. If that was any one of you guys, and I don't know whether you had the same experience as me, that's not a good look for our church. Let's say that it wasn't an Adventist, but somebody who was just visiting our church, and that person came and talked to them. That would be what the Adventist church would be for that person as their first experience. I went to a church only a few years ago, and again, let me just share with you something. I am not against healthy eating. I think it is something that we are called to do as a church. But I just want to show the dangers of going to any extreme on each side. I went to a community church plant, and they would only serve for the community church plant vegan raw food. Nothing was cooked. It wasn't even vegetarian. Now, when I came into that church and I asked them about this, they said, anyone who walks into this place has to come to our standards. Now, as I can hear, that's not where we want to be as a church. Health should not become a salvational issue. Let me just say that again. When you have a certain diet, it is not going to take you away from heaven. I just want to make that very clear. But God does care about what goes into our stomachs. As it said in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, look, you can eat whatever you want, but there are still consequences for it. And one of the big consequences for me, and I will share this as a personal testimony, is that I have not been honoring God with my body as of late. And I feel really bad about it. I have not been giving God all the honor that he deserves from what I do with my body. And so I want to find a balanced church family. Let's not go to the extreme, but let's maybe push forward and say, let's honor God with what we do with our bodies. Exercise, food, air, sunlight, you know the story. Look after your bodies because God looks after you. Let me bust this. Someone's time has gone off. I have to finish up. All right. Let me finish up. I've got about maybe five or ten minutes, but I just want to ask the question. If I've been busting all these myths about God and the physical body, then the last question that needs to be asked is, why? We've been talking about giving honor to God. Yes, that's really important. But why on earth should I leave this place and actually worry about what I do with my body? We know that God really cares about it, but what is going to push us? Well, when it comes to this idea of how we're created, I want to take you back to really the start. In Genesis, it says the way we were created was we were made out of the dust of the earth and the breath of God. 
In Ecclesiastes, it says the opposite, that when we die, we return back to the earth and the breath that was given to us goes back to God. Now, we tend to use those examples to show, see, you're not a spiritual orb that goes up to heaven when you die. You rest, you sleep. We use that as an example for the state of the dead. But I want to tell you that it's actually more important for us when we live. The fact that the body and the spirit of who you are is actually one whole being. You cannot separate the two. You can't say that you just focus on the spiritual, the emotional, and the mental as if you're this little orb taken away from this body that was given to you. When God talks about the importance of your being, he talks about your physical aspect. And there's a reason why in 1 Corinthians 6, it actually talks about sexual immorality. It doesn't just say, hey, eat well, look after your body, give honor to God. It actually says in there, it is not made for sexual immorality. The reason why he uses that example is because, well, let me ask you a question. If somebody commits adultery, is it just a physical act or are there other components to it? In other words, is doing something like that like a high five or a hug to someone? Of course it's not. It's connected emotionally, it's connected spiritually, it's connected mentally, and it's a physical act. The reason why Paul uses an example of sexual morality is because it is so damaging across the board. And so the physical becomes so much more. In fact, the last verse I want to give to you is in Romans 12, and you probably have seen this one before. And we're probably waiting for it. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is the true way of worship or to worship him. Did you know that the way that you look after your body is actually worship to God, that it, we're taking even a step further. It doesn't just honor him, but you actually worship him by keeping and looking after your bodies. Now, he doesn't use the word soul. He doesn't use the word spirit. He literally uses the word your bodies. And when you read it in the Greek, there is no way around it. It is your physical body that gives worship to God. I want to give just a confession in front of my church. I have not been worshipping God with my body. Last year, we all know this, the stories that I had with my health and I'm still continuing to have with my throat. And the first surgery that I had was, a, a, it, was a, it was basically plastic surgery on my nose. But they fixed up my nose and that was a biological problem couldn't do anything about it. It came from my father. He had the same thing. And I couldn't breathe properly at night, so they did that. A few months later, I had a fundoplication that was done on my stomach. That was self-inflicted. That wasn't a genetic problem. When I walked in with a specialist, I said, why on earth do I have this problem? They said, because you eat horribly. You need to eat better. One side was genetic. I had no control over it at all. The other side was totally self-inflicted. And so today, as I come here and I speak to my church and I have problems with my throat and problems with other things, I could just easily say, look, it was the genetic thing. God gave it to me. I had no part in this. It was all him. But then there is another part to play that was all me where I chose to eat the wrong foods. I chose not to go out and go for a walk. I chose just to sit on my couch and do nothing, and I got to where I was before. One of the things that I always bring up when it comes to health is that we have all been dealt different cards. We all have different problems. Some of them are genetic, and you can't help that. But you can still choose to play your cards the way you want to. You still have control over what you do with the body that was given to you. And so, church family, I want to encourage you, because this is not just about the physical. This is about the whole. We're keeping and we're stopping the series today, and this is going to be the conclusion to the Sozo series, is that God cares about your whole being. 
He cares about your spiritual, your emotional, your mental, and your physical health. And I'll let Ellen White finish. She says this, So closely is health related to our happiness that we cannot have the latter without the former. A practical knowledge of the science of human life is necessary in order to glorify God in our bodies. Many are drifting about without knowledge, like a ship at sea without compass or anchor. And what is more, they are not interested to learn how to keep their bodies in a healthy condition and prevent disease. Church family, I, I feel guilty that I'm preaching the sermon today because I have not treated myself well in this regard. And I usually never preach about something that I have not done myself, but today I had to. And so as we finish up this series, as we finish up today, I actually want to ask of you something, if that's okay. I actually want you to stand if you want to be able to allow God to sozo in your life. If there is an aspect in your life that you're struggling with spiritually, emotionally, mentally, or physically, I want you to stand as we sing our last song as an oath to God that you will try and do better in those areas. That you want to be able to allow God to work in your life, in your spiritual life, if there's something that you need to be able to say, Lord, I need more time with you in the morning. I have dropped the ball when it comes to knowing who you are. Then I pray and I ask you to stand right now. If there is something that is emotionally in your life that you need to let go, maybe there's an anger that you have with your parents or your family, or there's something that is stopping you from being connected with God, then I ask you to stand today as we sing our last song to give worship to Him, that today is the day that you will give to Him, and no more will you allow yourself to drop the ball when it comes to God. Maybe mentally there's something going on that you've struggled with all your life and that you had depression or you had something that stopped you from thinking clearly with him. Maybe there's some anger that has been built up for years in your life. Stand today and say that this will be the day that I will let that go. And if there is something physical in your life, if there is something that is stopping you, maybe you have a sickness Maybe you have something that has stopped you from going out and spending more time in nature or spending more time and allowing your body to be worshipped for God. I pray that you will stand right now and say, today is the day that I will make that change. Our last song is Worthy is the Lamb. And everything that we give to God we do because He is worthy of it all.